I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching Israeli News Live. You are watching today a prophetic segment of the news and a very important news broadcast today. I want to discuss with you uh, a little bit of the, of the information that was discussed by Prime Minister Netanyahu at the United States Congress in Washington, uh, D.C., and uh, it's actually going to be two different messages I'll be doing on this. Uh, tonight, I'm doing the prophetic message regarding uh, Esther because it's something that the prime minister brought up at the very beginning of his speech. Uh, he incites Israel as being a people of 4,000 years old. And that uh, he was saying the next night, which is tonight, is when we ce uh, celebrate the, uh, the Purim. Uh, the casting of lots, literally, is this. The lots is what the word poem uh, means. Uh, it was when uh, the decision was made that the Jews would be annihilated. And, uh, of course, Mordecai revealing this plot that was to kill off all the Jews of that era. And, um, and yet he brings before the United States Congress that Iran, he actually calls him a papal dictator, uh, but Iran is actually the one that would be used to destroy not only the Jews, but as well as the United States and anyone that opposes them around the world. I thought that was very interesting that he called him a papal, uh, a papal king, uh, speaking of about the Iranian uh, Khomeini. And yet at the same time, it, it made me realize that though Iran is being used as a tool once again, uh, the true papal man on the throne is actually the Pope of Rome. But seeing as he failed, Pope Pius XII failed in getting Hitler to kill off all the Jews of globally, now it seems clearly that the Vatican has turned to the Muslim world to do the job for them. Uh, so, And I just really thought that this was a perfect opportunity with the Prime Minister bringing this out um, to share with you the... Uh, the Purim story the, from the book of Esther. It's a customary thing for Jews to do on Purim is to read from the book of Esther. And so that's exactly where we're going to tonight. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Esther, I'll be reading from a King James version uh, of this. And uh, because it's adequate enough, there's just a few different words in there that are not correct, but that's not, not anything of a major ordeal. Uh, we start off in finding out in the story that... Uh, Ahasuerus, which is the king's name at that time, also, by the way, that is Artaxerxes in the book of Nehemiah. So we see this in the Septuagint. The second edition of the Septuagint uh, was written that uh, sort of Ahasuerus, they wrote Artaxerxes. So just for a little historical uh, overview about Persia, which is modern-day Iran, when, when the Jews had went into captivity, and that was not just, that was only the house of Judah, it was not the whole Hebrew nation, the house of Israel had already been scattered uh, more than 200 years prior to this event. But the house of, Israel, house of Judah goes into captivity as well by, by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, they're taken into captivity. And while they're in captivity, uh, this is uh, when it comes nearing the end of their captivity, we find that uh, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, the three different Persian kings who found favor, or the Jews found favor in their sight, uh, actually the first two, Cyrus and Darius, uh, had given orders to rebuild the temple, the, third, or the second temple at that time. And it was Artaxerxes, where we can find the countdown of Daniel's 70 weeks there, Artaxerxes is the one that actually speaks about or the timeline for Daniel 70 weeks comes in. Uh, if you ever want to see a more in-depth, detailed study on that, I write that in the book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? For those of you that do not know that I write uh, that book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? You can find that on our website, israelreturns.com, or as well as on Amazon, Books a Million, Google, I mean, all kinds of places. It's there. Anyway, not here to, 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 to get into books, but... I go into the timeline of that and how that works out. So, but uh, these were Persian kings that were actually for Israel at that time. And Artaxerxes actually seems to be one and the same uh, as, as the king of Esther, who Esther ends up marrying. Uh, also, Nehemiah was the cupbearer. Uh, a lot of things about that story that's very interesting. So, 
What we have here, though, there's a lot of symbology in this story. Uh, is it's clear that Artaxerxes or Ahasuerus will claim Ahasuerus for the sake of the story, seems this way it's written in uh, the King James. But Ahasuerus, he was married to Vashti, and Vashti is clearly a type of Israel. It's, she, she is a type of the house of Judah. And um, he's married to her, and the reason I say she's a type of, of, of Israel, the house of Judah, is because Ahasuerus being a type of Christ when Christ came in, 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 the, time, uh, in the biblical times there, uh, Vashti, in this case here, being a type of the house of Judah, they were, they were, uh, she was not willing to come when the king summoned her. And I know there was one time a dear friend of mine, in fact, he uh, works at the White House himself, said to me, we were, I was sitting in his living room, and uh, he's just one of the Secret Service agents there, and we were discussing this story of Esther. And he told me, he says, Brother Steve, he said, there's no way that Vashti could actually be a type of the, uh, of the Jewish people. He says, because she was a Gentile. And secondly, he says, she didn't want to be paraded before a bunch of drunken men. And right when he said it, not knowing the answer myself, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I said, my brother, you fail not knowing the Word of God. I said, for the word of God says on the day of Pentecost, when they came out and they staggered like a bunch of drunk men, they said, are these not all full of new wine? That was the people around them. That's what they saw. And in the story of the king here, Asaras, and, and he had invited the different nations to come down, the people that were over, because he basically controlled the entire world. He invited all the princes to come, and they were there just like it was on the day of Pentecost. I forget how many nations were represented there on the day of Pentecost. And he said every man was able to drink according to his own pleasure, and there was no one compelled to do so. Again, a perfect type of the receiving of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost. No one was compelled to receive the Holy Spirit. It was those that were, were free willing. Uh, but... Uh, but anyway, the, the, all the tongues and the nations of the people were gathered there, but it was actually for the Jewish people. Vashti was invited to come. He wanted to show off his wife, how fair she was. And this is what Christ had come. He came for his, his wife, and she refused him. She refused him. And of course, as a result of that, uh, he ends up separating himself from her. He never divorces her. He separates from her. And the house of Israel is divorced. We know that when she goes into captivity, but also God does say later in the same chapter, he says, he says to the house of Israel, he says, I am married unto you. So, um, you know, he's able to take her back. It's just like he says in the book of, I believe that's in the book of Joel, uh, or no, that's actually in the book of, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of that book there, where uh, Hosea, I believe it is, where he says uh, that... Uh, we see how she played the prostitute, and et cetera. But anyhow, uh, staying on track here, let's go uh, to verse 7, and we'll begin there in ch first chapter. They gave them drink in the vessels of gold, and the vessels uh, being diverse one from another, and royal and wine in abundance, and the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, uh, for so the king had appointed to all, all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure." As I said to you, also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to the king Ahasuerus. Now, she's made a feast because why? She's expecting the coming of the Messiah. So she is feasting. She has feast days. And in fact, it also shows the timing of when the rejection comes when she refuses to come out with the king. It was at the feast. It was the feast of Passover. She refused to come be with her king and, in fact, sold him out instead. Uh, but anyway, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with uh, Bistha, uh, Horbana, Bigtha, and he names the, the, the seven uh, chamberlains there, and served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the royal crown a crown royal, to show the people and, and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come to the king's commandment by his uh, chamberlains, and therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the chamberlains, there's no telling what all I, you know, the types may be in every single detail, and sometimes the story is, is the surface that we see the type in it. 
Uh, but, but naturally, they were bidden to come. Israel was bidden. There were, you had the 12 apostles that were reaching out to the, to the Jewish people of their day. You had John the Baptist that was reaching out. So we had a number of witnesses trying to reach out to, to Israel to accept the invitation that Christ had given. And, uh, but we move, on, we move on into the story here. And um, verse 13, I thought was very interesting as well. It says, Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. Isn't that interesting? The wise men. And we know that it was the wise men that came from the east that knew the time of his birth, the birth of Yeshua. And I know some people say, well, the three wise men. We don't really, as far as I remember right, we don't have a number of how many wise men actually came. But they did come, and they bore gifts. Um, anyhow, so we, we move on down, and it says, And the next unto him was uh, Karshina, and it names off the different wise men, seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat at the first in the kingdom. Which Another interesting thing there is where they're coming from. Uh, because of the fact that uh, the wise men actually came from the east as well, uh, came to the east and came to Jerusalem. So, um, but in um, but then it goes on to say, what shall we do unto the Queen Vashti according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains, and uh, Mimikin. Answer before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of the king of, of uh, the king Ahasuerus. So, what Israel did in the time when Yeshua came on the scene was in selling Christ out. It was uh, it was a, a, a very it was a disgrace. Period. Although we do know it was done for a purpose, we know that from knowing the story of Christ to begin with, had they not sold him out, there would have never been life for the Gentiles either. It's kind of the same as it goes for uh, Queen, Queen Esther. She would have never been the queen. had it not. If Vashti would have kept her place, then there would be no, there would be no uh, Esther coming in to be the queen. All right? Now, let's move on down, though, to chapter 2. Um, we see all, everything that happens to Vashti has all taken place. Um, and the, the, the real, a royal decree goes out to give her estate unto another. And when the king's decree, which he shall, uh, shall make, shall be, be published throughout all the empire. Uh, we, we read about that there. But we get into chapter 2. Uh, and I'm kind of going to go quick through this because I'm going to cover quite a few chapters here. So just bear with me. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Again, the same thing, another parallel, we see the same with Christ. When his anger is appeased, after Israel has reaped what she has sown, he says in his word, he will not hold his wrath forever. And we have many different places, Zechariah, Obadiah, Micah, chapter 4, uh, Malachi, so many places where he promises to redeem the house of Judah. Zechariah chapter 12 is one of the main ones where the house of Judah comes home first so that the house of Israel will not uh, be lifted up against the house of Judah uh, or envy the house of Judah. Very interesting, the, the different scriptural things. In fact, uh, that part about Zechariah, because that, that could just leave a lot of questions in mind. Let me, let me just take you real quickly to Zechariah 12. Um, he says in cha chapter 12... Um, Verse 6, In that day I will make the governors of Judah like an earth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheep. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Interesting, interesting. So, but anyway, so we, we, we go there, and then jumping on down, we find out that uh, uh, there, he sends out uh, looking for all the young virgins throughout the land, 
And that's another interesting parallel when we look at the ten virgins of, uh, of, the, of the Christian Bible in the, in the New Testament there where it speaks about the ten virgins uh, in the parable that Jesus gives. He said there were ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. Uh, and so again, the king seeks out all these virgins and then one ends up, ends up becoming the queen. Uh, much like the church today, there are many that are called, as the Bible said, but few are chosen. And Esther represents that few, that one in a million, so to speak, that is actually chosen. Um, and anyway, Hadassah was actually Esther, Esther's name, and um, she, is, she is a young lady. Her, she's raised by her uncle. Her mother and father were, were killed, uh, I, I'm a, or dead anyway, I should say. And it may have been that they died uh, uh, early on in the captivity. It's hard to say. Uh, when they died, but anyway, her uncle, uh, or not her uncle, but her, let's see, it says it actually in verse 7 of chapter 2, uh, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther's, his uncle's daughter. Um, so he's actually the cousin of Esther. It's not even the uncle himself, he's the cousin. And she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, and whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So God bless him for, for that work as well. Um, another thing that's very interesting too in chapter 2 is verse 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. I found that very interesting when I was reading uh, again through the book of Esther. And the reason being so, uh, she's taken it as one of the virgins that would be possibly selected by the king and she is given a charge not to say that she's Jewish, not to reveal her identity. And clearly, Esther, uh, you can look at her as a two, two types here. As you can look at her as a type of the Gentile bride, uh, which also can be looked at as a type of the, uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, the, the, uh, which, as we said recently in, in Genesis chapter 48, uh, where I read that to you myself, where it literally says in Hebrew, that Ephraim, the prophecy of Ephraim, that he would be all over the earth and his seed would be everywhere and he would be the fullness of the nations or fullness of the Gentiles. Uh, so he assimilates into the entire world. And Esther, it seems, also not only types Ephraim, but types the house of Israel returning back uh, because she is Jewish and she does not reveal her identity. Her identity is kept secret. Um, so that was very interesting. Now let's go down to verse, uh, um, uh, oh, another thing too, by the way, I wanted to bring out is that Esther is adopted by her cousin. She comes in by adoption. Now there's your type of your Gentile believers that, are, that come in as well. So Esther is, Esther is not just limited to the house of Israel, so to speak. Esther is a type of the Gentiles in the fact that she's the adopted child which is exactly what, what brings in uh, the converts of the Gentiles. They came in by adoption. So going to verse 17, And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that, um, that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, when Mordecai sat in the king's gate, Esther had yet showed her kindred nor people as Mordecai had charged her, for the Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him." Um, uh, any, anyway, very interesting. Now, when you look at Mordecai sitting at the king's gate, that is so obvious that we're looking at the house of Judah uh, because they're sitting literally in Israel at the king's gate. They're sitting, uh, we know that's the gate because what, what did Jacob say about the, uh, about the temple where the temple was built? right over the Holy of Holies there, where the Holy of Holies stood. He saw the ladder that went up into heaven and, and, and ascending and descending were the angels of God. He said, this is nothing else but the, but the door to heaven or the gate to heaven. And here they're sitting at the king's gate. The Israel is at the gate, but they have not taken the temple mount. 
They're only sitting at the gate. But by sitting at the gate, they find out a lot of in interesting things, including the decree that will come against them. So being there, is in, uh, Mordecai is in a very interesting uh, place there. So then the king made a great, okay, we, are, we know that. Uh, verse 19, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time, the, uh, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred, uh, nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. Okay, dropping down to um, uh, verse 22. And, and the king was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther, the queen. And, I'm sorry, let me back up to verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those who kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Osiris. And, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made on the, of the matter, it was found out, therefore, there were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Here's... That's, a, that's an interesting one, and I can't say what the type is on that. But, you know, as I read that, it just makes you wonder, is that a type of, of the, uh, in the times of Christ when they sought out uh, false witnesses and they actually found two against him? And, uh, and they, they, witnessed against, they witnessed against Jesus. And I've wondered if it's that. What's interesting, though, is that uh, those two that were guilty like that were hung on a tree. So, I, I don't know. That's just all hypothetical and speculation, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, chapter 3, though. After, after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of uh, Hamadiatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set the seat above all the princes that were with him. This is the important part. This is the identification of the Antichrist. And some people might say, well, how could you say that? Uh, because if Ahasuerus is the one promoting him and he is the type of Christ, why would, Christ, why would God promote uh, Satan? How, why would he promote the Pope of Rome when we know that he's false to begin with? It's simple. Remember what the scripture says about Pharaoh? God says, I have raised thee up and I have brought thee to this position to show my glory. Remember how it says in the New Testament, how, why can... How, Paul's writing, he says, about the potter. And he says, uh, why, how, why makest thou me thus? And he says, does not the potter have power over the clay to make one vessel to honor and one vessel to dishonor? If we can't speak against what the potter does. You see? So what is it? It's, yes, God literally puts the Pope of Rome in that position to show his glory. And of course, when it says Antichrist, there are many Antichrists, that's because there was a papal succession. Even, even Paul said back then that Antichrist spirit was already working. He said, many grievous wolves are already gone out among you. That's where your early church fathers come in that hated the Jews. Did you see Paul hating the Jews? Never did he hate the Jews. He's a true early church father, not these bunch of renegades out there that they called church fathers that hated Jews and hated women and everything else? You see, Christ wasn't a hater of women. You never saw Paul a hater of women. Oh, there's many people that mistranslate what Paul says and try to make it look like he's a hater of women, but that's not what Paul wrote. Even Jesus, he loved Mary Magdalene more than he did any of the other apostles. And we can find that in uh, what we consider to be extra-biblical writings about, about his uh, relationship with her. You know, he loved her, not like a, uh, well, you could say a husband and a wife too, for the simple reason, not, not in a sexual relationship because he kept himself uh, pure. But the point is, is uh, he, he loved her so much. And she sat at his feet continually. The women that followed him in the ministry. I was with Dr. Uh, Dr. Hutt from the University of Nebraska. and He's a Greek scholar. We were discussing this one time on videos, actually, in one of our videos early on. And Dr. Hutt says to me that he says the, the, the um, contemporary writings of that time about Paul 
was that he was the most liberal man of, of, of the entire era. He was, even Peter was not liberal like him. And the women that preached the gospel, there's plenty of documentation that they preached the gospel back then. Anyhow, we have messages on that. In case you're interested in those, you can look under our, our, our YouTube channel under women, uh, messages about women. There's a lot of them there. So anyhow, so we, we find out here that Haman is exalted. And the king's servant, verse 2, that were in the king's gate, notice he, he's also, he's given a seat. And that seat was given to the Pope of Rome in Israel. You're seeing biblical prophecy being fulfilled. The Pope of Rome was giving a seat at King David's tomb. Interesting, isn't it? Haman's given a seat as well. It's above all the princes that, are, that were with him. He exalted him. Just like the Pope's been exalted. And the Jews are subordinate to the Pope of Rome because they gave him a seat that sits right over the top of the tomb of David. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, for nor did him reverence. That's what the true believer is supposed to be like, Mordecai. And when you accept the Pope as God on earth, as your vicar, yes, then you are commanded to bow to him because you have done so. And the kings and the princes bow to the Pope of Rome to this day, kissing his ring on his finger. By the way, you'll find out later the king will give him his ring as well. They told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. See, this is when Israel breaks her covenant with Rome. That's your type for today. That's when Haman, that's when the Pope of Rome will become full of wrath is when Israel will, will stop bowing to Haman, to the Pope of Rome. Benjamin Netanyahu, who was anointed king over Israel, still bows to the Pope of Rome. Mr. Netanyahu, when you will stop bowing to the Pope of Rome, that covenant will be broken that y'all signed. I believe the covenant signed. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. It's interesting, because you know the Pope Pius XII, that's what he was intending to do with Hitler, destroy all the Jews, anywhere and everywhere he possibly could. But it didn't seem to work out too well. But they're going to try it once again. And brother, sister, they're going to try to get all the Jews all over the world. Be interesting to see how they do this one. And no doubt they're going to use the Muslim people to do so. It's interesting though, isn't it? You have President Barack Obama that's just over there, just bows down to, to the Iranians. Why is he bowing down to them? You know... Prime Minister Netanyahu said this is a bad deal. It is a bad deal. But the problem is, Mr. Prime Minister Netanyahu, do you not understand? The man that's calling the shots is not the Khomeini of Tehran. It's the Pope of Rome that is going to use the Muslim people, not just Tehran, but all the other Muslims that they have scattered throughout the world to hunt down and to kill all the Jews they possibly can. Hitler did it in the open, but he had Pope Pius XII in the background telling him what to do. Anyhow, let's move down to verse 8, uh, chapter 3. And Haman said unto the king, Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and all the people... Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. 
If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver of the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Can you not see the handwriting on the wall there? You see what I'm talking about? I think the reason why they put this in the movie about they cheat on their taxes is because he says to the king that it does not profit him. He says, their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Interesting, isn't it? That's kind of like, and I caught a, I, I got a lot of flack when I mentioned that uh, uh, the raiser of taxes, according to uh, the, the seventh king that would come, uh, but he would only continue a little bit, but there would be an eighth, and he would be of the seventh. By the way, when it, when it says that he's of the seventh, this was an interesting thing here to see. When it says he's of the seventh, it's because technically when Benedict resigned, he's still the Pope. The Pope of Rome is the Pope until he's dead. So when Pope Francis takes his place, when it says, the Bible says that the, the eighth king is of the seventh because he's actually uh, serving out the dynasty of the seventh king. And then people criticize that when I said that, uh, you know, that he went after the tax uh, evaders. I said it was showing that he was, that he was a raiser of taxes. And you have some critics, critics out there saying, oh, that's, that's really great now because he's trying to get those tax dodgers. Uh, you say he's a, he's a raiser of taxes. My point is, is that he raised tax revenue for not just the United States, not just all these different governments of the world. He raised it for himself, for the Vatican. Because the United States taxes go to England and England pays it to the Vatican. That's what I mean by raiser of taxes. Not that he raised their taxes higher. He was actually raising money, tax money, getting it from the people. It's exactly what Haman was looking to do. He was basically, like the movie even says, they were just tax dodgers. Let's do away with them. Remember Psalm 83, they take counsel, they counsel in secret on how to deal with the Jewish people. The Jews, we are considered a problem. Even in the movie, they made it clear the Jews were the tax dodgers. Interesting. I don't say there's not a lot of truth to that now. I'm not, this, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's the slyness of how the devil works. And remember, like I said, he is the eighth king is of the seventh because why? Pope Benedict's still alive. So Pope Francis is actually serving out Pope Benedict's term. Though he's the eighth king, he's still of the seventh king or of the seventh dynasty in that case there. So we, we go to find out he's willing to pay into the treasuries, which is exactly what Rome, Rome does. Rome will pay the bill. Pope Francis will pay the bill to be able to annihilate the Jews. Don't worry. He'll pay whoever he needs to pay. He'll pay every Muslim terrorist there is out there. And then he'll make it look good and have the United States fight and kill and die and everything else to make it look like they're fighting terrorism. You wait and watch and see what happens. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of uh, Hamad, Hamad, uh, excuse me, Hamidatha, the Agite, the Jews' enemy. Rome's always been Israel's enemy. That's a biblical one for you, too. Esau, by the way, is, is Israel's enemy. Uh, he, they're the enemy of, of God, and, and, and we find out in Obadiah that Esau is, or Edom is, Rome. Because they're the ones that destroyed the second temple. And that's what God says in the book of Obadiah. And he blames that on Esau. And it was Titus, the Roman general, that did just that. So we know where the Edomites are now reigning at. They're reigning from Rome. So anyhow, he takes and he gives him his ring. Look at all the people that bow down and kiss the Pope's ring. It's interesting, isn't it? World dignitaries bowing and kissing the Pope's ring. Oh, my gosh. So... 
Anyway, he gives him the ring, and that's basically when the Pope of Rome would be given the authority. Because we look at that, remember, Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus is a type of Christ, and Satan can do nothing without God's permission. In this case here, the king, Artaxerxes, his real name, is a type of Christ, giving permission for the Pope of Rome to carry out his plot. As we see in the times of the Holocaust, it just drove the Jews to their homeland. And the Iranians actually stated that if we can get all the Jews into one place, it'll save us time so we don't have to hunt them down all over the world and kill them. That's what I say now. Verse 13, skip down to verse 13. And letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to, to, to destroy, to kill, and to cause perish all Jews, both young, old, little children, women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Exactly. That's, 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 like I said, Pope Pius XII, that's what he was doing with Hitler. And that's what they did. They, took the, they, they killed both young, old men, women, children, didn't care what it was, and took all their spoils. The job wasn't finished, so now they're going to come back and do it again. So the Ira Iranians' leaders, that's, that's, the, that's the Rome's uh, new uh, Hitler for today. Goodness. Let's go on to chapter 4. And when Mordecai perceived, actually in the Hebrew, that word is Yodea, which means and when Mordecai knew all that was done. I, don't, I didn't want to think of the word perceived because if the per word perceived is almost as if he has a... Um, like a revelation of something, and it's not a revelation, it's in Hebrew, he actually says, uh, uh, Mordecai Gadea. So, and when Mordecai knew all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out of the midst of the city and out, of the, uh, uh, out into the, excuse me, and, and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And there's a good possibility that this is a type. In Zechariah 12, where it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth as his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as in the mourning of Hadad, Hadad, Hadad Ramon in the valley of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn every family apart. And then it goes on to show how the house of David, the house of Levi, the house of Shimei, and the house of uh, uh, Nathan, I believe it is, apart. All of those are the house of Judah. It's the houses, each one. Uh, Shimei is from the house of Benjamin. Uh, David and Nathan are from the house of Judah. And of course, Levi are the Levites. That were the three tribes that were present at the time when Christ was there. So it's interesting that we see that. And Mordecai being a, being a representation of the house of Judah because that are the, those are the Jews there in the king's province there. Uh, and he's sitting at the gate mourning in sackcloth and in ashes because why? He now knows what's going to happen. His, his eyes have been opened. And that's why I kind of wondered, is, is it a possibility that that types the recognizing of Christ the Messiah at that point? Uh, now it came to pass on the third day, moving on, I'm sorry, I'm still in chapter 4, uh, back over to chapter 4, verse 3, in every province, uh, whithersoever the king commandeth, his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. This is as this decree came known all over the world. And, uh, and I think this may have a lot to do with when we see the Jews begin to return home from around the world that's still even a greater uh, Exodus yet to come. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. And then called Esther for Hatak and one of the king's chamberlains, and whom had appointed to attend unto her, and gave him commandment to, to Mordecai to know what it was uh, why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai in the street and the city which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money that Haman promised to pay the king's treasuries of the Jews to destroy them. 
Uh, as I said, Pope will finance this war. He'll definitely, he's the one that's financing the war to, to annihilate the Jews completely. And so at any rate, though, uh, verse 8, and also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. Now, let me bring something to your attention here. She's to go into the king's presence. You see, when we think about, there's a lot of people, we look at the rapture or, or, or however you want to look at this here. But, I, and I've actually said before in times past, I believe that this is when she goes before the king. It's a, I believe it's a, like a type of the rapture. But there's one thing that I saw when I was rereading this again that has actually concerned me a little bit about that being a type of the rapture. It, it seems to be more so that Esther, because she is a Jew, is a type of the house of Israel. Because why? She has found favor in the sight of the king to begin with and is married to him. And there are many, not, and, and again, don't make the mistake, there are Gentile believers out there just as much as they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the house of Israel, with the, with the, with the tribe of Ephraim, that have lost basically their identity of being Jewish that are dispersed throughout the entire world. Many of them have come in and believed Yeshua to be the Messiah, and therefore they have found favor in the king's sight in regards to that. And they're married to him. But see, it wasn't just a Jew that was among the virgins of, of, his, of his kingdom. There were also Gentile women as well, showing that the king has more than just Jewish, uh, a Jewish bride there. He actually has, he has a, a, a bride that is, that is a Gentile bride as well. That's why I say, don't misunderstand when I say the house of Israel. The reason why the Esther is married to him is because the house of Israel still is married to the king. He said so in his word. Even though he gave her a divorce, a bill of divorce, he says later in the same chapter, uh, he says, repent, return. He says, for I am married unto you. And Esther here types the house of Israel. And, and what's interesting in this is because Mordecai sends a word back to her and tells her, you know, she wants to know what ails him. And Mordecai says to her, um, let me just find that. Uh, yeah, move down to verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape of the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Can you imagine this? She had came to a place. This is like, this is like uh, the Ephraimites that are the fullness of the Gentiles or, or the house of Israel, period, that have recognized that you today, those of you that, that, are, that are Christians that know who Jesus Christ is as your Savior, and you have come into the, to the economy of Christ, you have believed upon Him, but yet you know you're Jewish. You know you have Jewish ancestry. This is your time to plead for God. And as He said, for such a purpose of this were you born. And if you don't do it, he'll raise it up from somewhere else. And he said, think not that you'll be spared in your own house. No matter you're a Christian in another part of the world, those Muslims, the Vatican will use them to kill all the Christians that don't agree with their theology. So you won't be spared either. This is what you're raised up for to do. That's why I had to back up and think that doesn't actually represent a rapture at that point there because why? He, Mordecai says to her, Think it not of thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. 
In other words, even though you've accepted Yeshua to be your Savior, it doesn't mean that you lose the fact of being the queen. No, you just die being the queen. But your people will die as well. And this is the time that we have to pray for the Jews more than any other time. Let me kind of go quickly through this here. Let's go down to chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the royal apparel. Uh, Esther put on her royal apparel. She stood in the, in the, in the uh, inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the, of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given unto thee to the half of, of, of the kingdom. And of course, as we know, she, she later, she invites him to the banquet. She prepares a banquet for him and Haman. And she asks him to both come. Haman doesn't really know what's going on. And uh, we, especially in verse 12, when it says, Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let, let no man come in with the king into the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. See, the Pope thinks he's doing a great job too. He thinks he's somebody. See? And um, look at verse 13. Yet all, all, all this availeth me nothing so long as, as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. He just, you know, Israel, in, or the Jewish people in Israel today, the house of Judah, sitting right there at the gate of the Temple Mount is a thorn in Pope Francis' side. And he wants to see that change. That's what those secret meetings, remember in Psalm 83, they have those secret meetings together. Another place, uh, uh, I think it's in uh, Micah 4, they got, they got secret councils what to do with the Jews. Verse 14, Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let gallows be made fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai, they, they may be hanged thereon, and then go out thou merrily with the king into the banquet, and the, and the thing pleased Haman, and, the, and he caused the gallows to be made. Isn't that interesting? Haman and his wife. There's your churches. There's your churches all joining up together. His friends, because he rules every nation under the earth. There's your secret meetings once again. Destroy the Jews. Mm. Chapter six, and the king said, "What honor?" And okay, that's where he, that's where, that's where he ends up making him honor Israel, because he's ready to kill him, and yet the king keeps the king ends up causing Haman to have to honor Mordecai, because he remembered the kindness that Mordecai showed to him when it was reread to him. Remember, so that's what happens. God, Israel begins begins to come up in God's memory. And what did God do? He made, he made the Catholic Church come up with the idea of making, uh, getting a hold of the land of Israel. He sent the British in there to take it over because the Pope of Rome thought he would go in there and take over. And instead, all the Jews ended up coming home. They found a way in. And the Pope's plan backfired on him. And basically, God made the Pope of Rome parade the Jewish people around on his horse. The Jews had come home. You know that under the British mandate, they wouldn't let the Jews come in. Oh, they said it was a homeland for the Jews, but it was only for the ones that they had selected. But finally, something broke, and the Jews got in. Legally or not legally, they got in anyway. And that's when Israel began to come in, and that's when they became a nation in 1948. So many interesting things that are happening here. Let's close this off here and as I come here to the end here. Um, we find out that uh, verse 6 here, chapter 6, So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? And this is, that's what we just spoke about that. Going down to verse 13. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, this is after he was so humiliated by having to uh, bring uh, Mordecai around on the horse. 
Do you know the, the horse represents a beast of uh, burden? He's a beast of power, strength. He's also a beast of war. God made the Vatican bring Israel to her homeland. So his wife says to him, this is Haman's wife and all his friends, everything that had befallen him, he said, I'm saying, they, they tell him, tell her, tell him, them all that. He tells them that. And she says, uh, excuse me, and then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, if Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, they begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. I think that's kind of interesting because no doubt there are those that sit in the meeting. This is what I find interesting to begin with. He already knows. It was a proven fact. He knows he's a Jew. That's why he put the decree out. But then in one of the, another one of these secret meetings, the word comes from him from the wise men, and they said, if he be of the seed of the Jews... You see, even Rome and these people that are meeting together, as we see in the Khazar theory and all this other nonsense going on that the Jews are really not the Jews, and even there's a lot of people that have jumped on this bandwagon now. It's a racial thing. That's sad. You know, the Jews were both, were all different colors type people there because it, that was also an assimilation through time. It's not just one race of people. Just like the Jews that are there today, sometimes they get that stuck in their head too. You got to be olive complected and brown eyes. That's not true. The Jewish people have been dispersed to all the world. They're all kinds of people. And they question whether or not Mordecai was really a Jew. Same thing today. They question whether or not the Jews in the homeland now are really Jews. But they said, if he really is a seed of Judah, you have begun to fall, and it will be your downfall. And that's something that they are worried about because some of his friends and some of the wise men amongst him, like, like for example, like John Hagee, who has really been a staunch supporter of Israel all of his life, knows if these are really the Jews. I, I wouldn't doubt that Hagee said that to the Pope or to the Vatican people. They might have told him, they're not really Jews. They're Khazars. They're not really Jews. We're going to help bring back the real Jews. Maybe they told this to John Hagee. Maybe that's what made him crack. I don't know. It's just speculation. But you know, the thing is, is Hagee got enough sense to know too, and I'm sure he would have told him that. You know, that these really are the seed of Israel. If these are really the seed of the Judah. It'll be your downfall. And that's exactly what happened. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther, the queen, and this is when Esther finally speaks out. He's indicted. Let's go to verse 5. Then the king Asaras answered and said unto the Esther, she makes petition for her life, is what she's doing. She's already been making petition for her life. She's said that her people are going to be sold for bondmen and bondwomen. And, and if I held my tongue, this is in verse 4, although the enemy could not uh, uh, countervail the king's damage, the king of Ahasuerus answered and said to Esther, the queen, who is he, or where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is the wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of the wine and his, in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther, the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden in the palace of the banquet of the wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed where, whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of, out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And as we know, Haman was hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. So God will do the same to Rome. He will destroy that city. I'm Stephen Ben-Noon with Israeli News Live, your prophetic moment. I hope you enjoyed the news today. Shalom.